Cowling, prepaid call from... Can An inmate at the Santa Rosa County Sheriff's Office. This call will be recorded and monitored. Your advance pay account balances $63.54. For customer assistance, billing inquiries, or to block future calls, dial 1-877-650-4249. To hear the cost of this call, press 8 now. To accept or press... This call is subject to monitoring and recording. Do not use three-way or call waiting features during this call. Thank you for using Global Tell Link. All right, thank you, brother. All right, thank you, Pastor Hoven. <clears throat> this question comes in from Lisa, and uh, Lisa writes, I've heard Shermer, the stupid skeptic, say several times that if trilobites, trilobites were found in the same bedding plane as hominids, then that would prove the evolution theory wrong. I'm paraphrasing except for parent, parent, parenthesis. <clears throat> Hasn't that been found a while back in some footprints, footprints along a river? <clears throat> and that's from Lisa. Well, in their thinking, a trilobite, uh, which looks kind of like a giant pill bug or a roly-poly, we would call them, uh, lived 600 million years ago, or whatever the number is they've got for it, okay? And humans didn't come till 3 million years. See, they've got this new the geologic column, where they, that's their Bible. They interpret everything in light of that dumb geologic column. So they would say humans and trilobites, fossils, are never found in the same rock layer. Okay, I, A, I don't think that's, I don't think that's true, I don't know. I think Carl Ball has evidence of the human footprint on top of the uh, trilobite, where somebody smashed one. So you can contact creationevidence.org uh, to see that. He may actually have the, the footprint itself. I think it's called the Meister print. I don't know. But it wouldn't matter. I would say humans and chickens have never been found in the same rock layer either. Does that prove humans and chickens did not live at the same time? Well, no, they're still alive, okay? Maybe the reason humans and chickens are not found buried together in the same rock layer is because humans don't normally hang out with chickens all day. Maybe that's the reason. Maybe humans didn't hang out with trilobites. Maybe trilobites are a bottom of the ocean dwelling creature, and in the flood they would be buried first because they're already at the bottom, and humans would be buried later because they're smarter, well, some of them are, and could figure out a way to avoid drowning. So, hey, I don't know that it's true that they haven't been... This call is from the Santa Rosa County Sheriff's Office. B, it wouldn't matter that they haven't been found together. Not finding evidence it is not evidence that they didn't exist together. That's insane. Any court of law would say, well, you've got to be nuts. What is wrong with you? So, uh, it's all based on their dumb geologic column, which I cover on my video number and maybe a little bit in number four of my uh, video series. Anyway, thank you. Hope that helps, Lisa. And uh, I would love to win Mr. Shermer to the Lord. I think he may have another reason for not wanting to come to Christ and not wanting to admit the Bible is true. I want to read Romans chapter 1 to see if you can find that reason. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, thank you, Pastor Hovind. Uh, the next question, um, I think you've heard before, but I'm going to take full responsibility for the lost tapes of uh, Ken Hovind, the 15-minute lost tapes. Uh, this is uh, one of the questions that I asked, I think, during those uh, that 15-minute period, and I'll ask it again if you don't mind. Um, it's from Davey, and Davey writes, Hello, Kent. Glad to hear the charges are dropped. Uh, the school systems lie daily to the kids who attend to them. When a school kid talks to a kid who doesn't attend public schools, they regurgitate what they have been taught and try to lead the others astray. When I showed them it was a lie, what they were discussing, it caused the school kid to run to school and call uh, her teacher a liar. I can prove I'm right. What is the right way to approach this? Uh, and I guess um, that comes from Davey from Tennessee, and he's concerned that when uh, these school children are learning that evolution is a lie, they're calling their teachers a liar in the classroom, and maybe uh, that's not a, the best approach. Any comments to that, uh, Pastor Hoven? Well, certainly, yes. Well, A, the teacher probably does not know that they're lying. They're probably simply repeating what they, what they heard. So I would say this textbook is teaching a lie. And teacher, you shouldn't repeat that. If you found a, a math textbook that had a typographical error that said 2 plus 2 is 5, what would you do? 
if the teacher read that in the class and said, hey, students, look at 3, page 7, the book says 2 plus 2 is 5, and a student said, teacher, you're lying. No, no, no. Teacher, the textbook is wrong. So I would certainly put it off on the textbook, not on the teacher, if possible. Secondly, I would certainly try to be respectful and, try, and talk to the teacher privately after class, not in front of the class. Nobody likes to be corrected in front of anybody, especially a teacher in front of a class. So talk to them privately. Thirdly, it might be wise to have an adult do that. Have your mom or dad or youth director or pastor or somebody contact the teacher and say, look, we need to work out the situation here. There's something in your textbook that's not true. Here's the evidence that it's not true. Uh, would you please stop teaching this? Uh, so this is, we don't send kids off to war. Why are we sending kids off to fight with, against inaccurate textbooks? My video, Lies in the Textbooks, is two and a half or three hours long, dealing with a bunch of lies in the textbooks. Hand that to the teacher and say, teacher, would you please watch this? Uh, if that won't do it, have your dad say, here, teacher, I'll give you 50 bucks if you watch this. Oh, okay. But I really, most of the teachers that I have met over the years, which would number into the thousands and maybe tens of thousands, are, are sincere, dedicated. I mean, they're, they've given their life to this task. They love teaching. My brother helped lead me to the Lord. He taught uh, public school 34 years. And godly man, loves the Lord. His son is a pastor of a church in Cleveland, Ohio now. Um, large, successful church, Cadhoven. And he did the videotape on, uh, on money that the Eric's Ministry of Creation Today sells. Fabulous video on Godonomics. Great series. Anyway, so, yeah, the, the parents should teach the children, don't go, to, don't go to class and call your teacher a liar in front of the class, certainly. <laughs> but secondly, find out a way to put it off on the textbook instead. Don't, don't, uh, and if the teacher insists, no, this is true, it might be time for the parents to get involved or the school board or the or Congress or president or, you know, God, take it up as high as you want to go. But don't allow lies to be taught. I'm not saying overlook it. What I'm saying is not a tactful approach to call the teacher a liar. Now, there may be some teachers who deliberately lie to their kids because they want them to believe in evolution. Some of the debates I've had with some of the atheists, I think they are deliberately teaching things that they know are not true because they don't have any other evidence. I think it was a debate I did, I don't recall now, or maybe just a discussion Q&A after, after a session. It might have been at Berkeley where this uh, first person said, after I pointed out some of the lies in the textbooks, that this ought to be taken out. Don't teach about the embryo having gill slits or the geologic column having any common sense at all to it. And I went through a bunch of the lies in the textbooks. And this person said, well, if you take all of this stuff out, what are you going to replace it with? And I said, you have got to be kidding. You're saying, I have successfully proven that the evidences you use for your religion of evolution are incorrect. And rather than remove them, I have to find a replacement. I have to find evidence for your religion before we can take out a lie? You have got to be kidding. Just, if you don't have any evidence for your religion, I'm sorry. Maybe you should consider getting a new religion. But no, I'm not going to go around finding evidence for your religion. I think your religion is dumb. But wow, you're welcome to believe it. But you're not welcome to lie about it, to pass that off to the next generation at my expense. Go start a private school where they teach evolution and everybody pays to come learn it if they want to. But get it out of the public school. That is my humble, very humble, very totally unbiased opinion. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Pastor Hovind. I think I've got two more, and we will have uh, covered all yep. the one, all the ones that we lost. <laughs> um, uh, the next question. Okay, sounds great, bro. All right, very good. The next question comes from uh, Patrick, and Patrick writes, uh, "Dear sir, please thank Dr. Hoven for answering my previous question about homosexuality. I was so happy that Dr. Hoven took the time to help me. I have another question involving going to heaven. If there was a child or adult who had never had a chance to know Christ, but lived a good life according to Christian standards, when they die, do they still go to heaven? Kind regards, Patrick." Well, thank you. Uh, if, if it was possible to go to heaven by living a good life, 
life then? Of course they would go. However, it's not possible to go to heaven by living a good life. First of all, nobody lives a good life. If you read Romans chapter 3, starting with about verse 10, all the way to the end, there is nobody good. Even what we as humans would consider good is not considered good by God's standard. So nobody lives a good life. Secondly, that's not how you go to heaven anyway. Being good won't do it. It's like hanging from a length of chain off the edge of a cliff. You only have to break one link to fall, and it can be any one of the links. Maybe they've never broken 99% of the links, but only one of them. They've only broken one law. And by man's standards, we would say, wow, that's a good person. Well, they're still going to fall. And God is going to judge every single sin. If you, if you murdered one person, Patrick, and went to court and used the excuse, judge, I only murdered one person. There are thousands of people I have known that I did not murder and did not even think of murdering. Would you please put my good against my bad? They would laugh at you. Of course, okay, Patrick, we will not punish you for the good you've done. We will only punish you for the bad, and you would get punished accordingly. So, there isn't anybody who's under, even a little child. Now, there may be a provision, as we've talked about before, as we see it with the situation with David and Bathsheba when their baby died. The only verse I'm aware of that deals with the subject at all, David is talking about this baby that had died, and he said, uh, I cannot bring him back to me, but I shall go to him. First Samuel, or whatever it is, near the end of... I'd have to look it up anyway. So, uh, that, that you go to heaven because of what Jesus has done. It's because of his righteousness. So I think probably children are covered. There's a situation called the age of accountability, which is a man-made term, not found in the Bible, but I think it's... This call is from the state of Lincoln County Sheriff's Office. That up to a certain age, kids are simply not accountable for their sins. So but I, I can't prove that. All I can do is share that one verse with you. But so, yes, uh, nobody lives a good life, and that's not how you go to heaven anyway. So, hope that helps, Patrick. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Pastor Hovind. The next, uh, it's, it's uh, really a, a, somebody's asking you to comment on both President Obama, the so-called president, and Bill Nye. Uh, President Obama is reported uh, about uh, on May the 20th, which is about, what, uh, five days ago? It's written, those who, do not, those who deny global warming are putting at risk the United States and the military sworn to defend it. He told cadets at the U.S. Coast Guard Academy, failure to act would be dereliction of duty, their commander-in-chief said. And then Bill Nye is reported as coming out and saying that those who do not support the uh, government... Uh, the government-funded position of global warming, uh, those people are unpatriotic and uh, uh, basically uh, not patriotic to the United States of America. Any comments about uh, the so-called President Obama's statements about global warming and being patriotic and a dereliction of duty and Bill Nye's support of President Obama, so-called president? Well, it's sad when uh, inmates run the institution, the mental institution, but that's exactly what we have a classic example of here. Both of those statements are, are insane. They're silly. They're wrong. Okay, they're stupid. Tell them I said so. Amen. If there is any global warming, if there is any, A, could it be that man is causing it? Could it be a natural cycle? B, could it be that our fixes to it are worse? Let's take a look at the economy. The economy is bad, so the government says, here, let's collect $10 billion from everybody so that we can pay out $300 million to people on welfare so they can go spend it at the store so the store gets a $10,000 profit. Wow, we just boosted the economy by $10,000. Hmm. You did? <laughs> I think you just hurt the economy by billions of dollars. Hmm. It just get the government has no business being involved in this anyway. Show me any place in the Constitution where the federal government or the military has the authority to be involved in a war against global warming, even if it is true. Even if it's true, what business do they have fighting this war? It's, that's not that's not part of their job. And I don't think it is true as far as the global warming, and I think the business of spraying the sky with the chemtrails is making it much worse. Think about it. What does it cost? How much damage does it do to the environment to dig up all the iron or the aluminum ore, smelt it down, make aluminum, turn it into powder or the aluminum oxides or whatever they're spraying? 
how much environmental damage is done to create this stuff, and then to load up the airplane with gasoline and this stuff and get up in the clouds and spray it all day. And you're going to reflect... You have 60 seconds remaining. You're going to reflect the sunlight over 0.000001% of the Earth and think you saved the planet when you just did a trillion times more damage to the planet. Your solution is worse than the problem. Like you got a pimple on your finger, so you cut off the arm. This is dumb. Yeah, both of those statements those guys made are, are wrong and stupid. And I'll be quoted on that if you'd like. Amen. I got more, brother. Should I call? Uh, we 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 do have enough. We do have more if you have the time. Yes, sir. Let me. Uh, there's two guys waiting for the phone. Let me call back in a half hour if it comes open again. Okay. Okay. Sounds good, Pastor Owen. God bless you, sir. Bye bye. All right, that's Pastor Hoven. I do need some more Bible questions, folks, and uh, I do get a few Bible questions. For instance, uh, Ollie sent me uh, some Bible questions, but it's just too long, man. Uh, it's like two pages, and I, I can't go through two pages in a fifteen-minute call. If we could try to condense them down to at least a couple of paragraphs, uh, that would be best. Uh, I do my best in reading these questions. I do. Um, I'm very grateful, and it's very uh, good you guys sending them. But when you send them, and they're like two to three pages, it's just very, very tough to work them in on a 15-minute call. So uh, please continue to send me Bible questions or evolution creation questions are just as good. And if you want to send stuff about just uh, what's going on in America, I'm sure he'll uh, give his opinion on that too. Uh, we got 76 days, guys. That's a long time to be stuck in county jail. He's already been there uh, nearly a year. Uh, but uh, we'll try to. You know, if, if he's already gone this long, I'm sure he can make it, but uh, it's just absolutely um, heartbreaking that we don't have anybody left in government to do the right thing, and this uh, Harvard-educated Charles E. Samuels Jr. is ignoring it, and uh, all these congressmen are ignoring it, and uh, just absolutely uh, heartbreaking. For customer assistance, billing inquiries, or to block future calls, dial 1-877-650-4249. To hear the cost of this call, press 8 now. To accept this call, 5 now. This call is subject to monitoring and recording. Do not use three-way or call waiting features during this call. Thank you for using Global Tail Link. Hey, we're open here if you're free, brother. Did yes, sir. Did you read this from Wolfgang Rudy? Why don't you go ahead, babe? Hang on. Go ahead. Now speak up, babe. Make sure he can hear you. Okay. I thought, I thought you were going to say something, Pastor. No, no. I'm fine. Okay. Um, uh, Razor wanted me to read you this. It says, Hello, Ken Holden. I'm Wolfgang. I'm 15 years old, and I live in Ontario, Canada, and I've started watching your videos around sometime in January. And it has revived my faith in Lord Jesus Christ, and I want to thank you for that greatly. My question for you is regarding the Ken Ham and Bill Nye debate. I'm wondering if you might be willing, if you would be given the chance to debate Bill Nye, and with your debate skills, I know anyone that's not willingly ignorant will realize the truth. I sure did. I believe the whole story on evolution, but God led me to your videos, and I have changed my life a lot in the last few months, but still have some work to do. Thank you. Hope you get out soon. God bless. Well, thank you, uh, Wolfgang. Appreciate that. I'm glad to hear it's made a change and spread them around. Uh, I did make quite a few comments on the Bill Nye Ken Ham debate. Uh, but I read the transcript of it, I believe, and made some comments on one of the previous programs months ago. The answer to your question is yes, absolutely. I'd be thrilled and honored to debate Bill Nye. I think he's a very intelligent man and extremely wrong in what he believes on this dumb evolution religion. Um, that's putting it kindly. Okay. So yes, I'd be honored. I don't think he will. And I don't think it's debate skills. I don't think I'm a skilled debater. I think I'm on the right side of the argument. It's That's all it takes. You don't have to be uh, smart. He may be smarter than me. He may have more training than me. He, he, he may be taller than me. I don't know. It doesn't matter. On this topic, he's wrong. I'm right. God created the world in six days, about 6,000 years ago. It was destroyed by a flood 4,400 years ago. All of the known scientific evidence I'm aware of supports that position. No human alive today is old enough to have seen either the creation or the flood. So we have to go by either historical evidence or scientific evidence, like looking at the, the tracks in the sand or fingerprints. Or there's second 
secondary evidence. Uh, that's what we have in all of the evidence from history or science or common sense points to a recent creation and a devastating worldwide flood. It's plain and simple. And yes, I will defend that position against Bill Nye or Einstein or anybody else. It's not because I'm smarter. It's because I'm on the right side. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that, Wolfie. All right. <clears throat> thank you, Pastor Hovind. Uh, babe, you got any more questions? No. Okay. Um, so, Pastor Hovind, uh, some questions come in, and I don't think they're fair to ask you, but I'm going to go ahead and read it anyway, and just uh, know that uh, because uh, you're in prison, it's almost like looking through a portal, and you don't really see all the drama that's going on uh, in its entirety, and I think God must like a drama, because we sure do have a whole lot of it here on planet Earth. But I will read the, uh, I will read the email, and then you, of course, uh, can respond however you see fit. I'd I will, I will preface it by saying I'm not sure this is a fair email to post to you while you've been in prison, but I will read it anyway. Dear Dr. Hoven, it comes from Stefan and Brooke Rivera. We are undergoing a thunderstorm too, by the way, Pastor Hoven, so if we get disconnected, it wasn't me. Uh, we're in the middle of a lightning thunderstorm. But in any event, <clears throat> Stefan and Brooke Rivera write, uh, I hope all is well, and I'm eager for your release, Pastor. I would like to briefly thank you for your faithfulness in proclaiming the gospel and reaching so many people. My question is slightly a concern in regards to Pastor Stephen Anderson. Pastor Anderson is great in explaining the post-trib theology and KJV onlyism, which I appreciate. However, he fails to proclaim the gospel biblically by rejecting uh, to use the law lawfully as a schoolmaster, which leads us to Christ. I enjoy evangelism and apologetics and have learned so much from evangelists such as yourself and Brother Ray Comfort. Pastor Anderson has continually slandered guys like Ray Comfort and even calls your son a false prophet publicly. Then, in my opinion, uses you, Dr. Hoven, to appease his agenda, which seems similar to a Westboro Baptist Church style. He, <clears throat> he says things like, quote, we need to kill all the homos, end quote. My question to you, Dr. Hovind, is, does this concern you being as that you cannot observe these things from prison, and can you consider speaking with Pastor Anderson about this, maybe even a personal conversation? Thank you again, and God bless, Stefan and Brooke Rivera. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I don't know Steve Anderson very well. He did come to visit me in Colorado and drove all the way up there from... I guess you can figure the distance, Phoenix, Arizona to Florence, Colorado, probably four or five hundred miles. Spent the weekend, we had a wonderful talk. I think he loves the Lord. I think he's trying to do what's right. I've heard a couple of his sermons. He did interview me on the phone for his movie that he did. I don't know what he believes on end times, and I don't know that I agree, because I don't know what he believes. I have been told it's more of a pre-trip uh, position. If that's true, then I disagree. Uh, I am post-trib pre-wrath, and the tribulation actually takes place in the last half of the seven years. People don't realize there's a time of wrath that falls in the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, the thousand-year period, comes completely after the seven-year period. And the first about three years of that day of the Lord, and that's where the wrath of God falls. And so people don't get that distinction, and it messes up all their end-time theology, which is called eschatology. Be careful to, to use the big word. Uh, as far as uh, Stephen Anderson's position on salvation and how a person is saved, rejecting the law, the Bible clearly says the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, I understand. There seems to be quite a, quite a conflict among Christians these days of exactly what must I do to be saved. Uh, and this has kind of always been the thing, but it's coming to the head again now like it does every 20 or 30 years. Uh, is it easy believism or is there a series of steps we have to take? Someone here gave me a book and articles to read just two days ago saying, oh, you got to do it. Probably most of the people who think they're saved aren't. And, you know, you don't just pray a prayer. The other side of that coin is uh, 2 Peter 3. God is not willing that any should perish. He's, he wants everybody to be saved. So if we look at this from God's perspective, he did everything. He came to the earth, became a human, died on the cross. He gave the law to Moses like a mirror. The mirror shows, wow, I'm a sinner. The mirror does not comb your hair or brush your teeth or pop the zits. All the mirror does is show you where your errors are, where your things need to be fixed. That's the thing that the law does. I look at the law and say, wow, I'm a sinner. 
I don't think you have to look at all of the law. I don't think anybody would be capable. So it's a matter of, you see, a person doesn't even need to have, I mean, a, a person in the jungle that's never heard of the Bible can realize, wow, I've, I've, I've offended God. I mean, nature itself teaches us some things. And that's taught clearly in Romans chapter 1 and other places. So, um, yes, I do. I'm in the camp that it's easy to get saved and God is not willing that any should perish. And salvation, a person can come to Jesus without the Bible. If they simply, if someone introduces them and explains to them the gospel story, they don't have to be able to read at all. Uh, other people say, oh no, they have to do all these, you know, 12 steps to get to heaven and all that stuff. So I am much more on the easy get to heaven. So I don't know what so Steve Anderson believes on that. You'd have to talk to, talk to him. As far as kill all the homos, I don't know what he said. Uh, that's been taken out of context. Um, You'd have to deal the deal with him on that. I would be glad to talk with him. I, I consider him a friend. I do not know what he believes on all issues, and I do not know that I agree with him on all or even any issues. I don't know him that well, but I'm well, sure I'm willing to talk to him anytime. All right? All right. Very, very good. Thank you, Pastor Hogan. Uh, I'd like to add that he made a documentary called After the Tribulation. He's post-trib. Yes, and, I, and I'm part of that documentary, I think. Someone yes. said he voted me in there. Yep, you're, you're sitting on a picnic table. Crap. You're sitting at a picnic table with him, if I remember correctly. Uh, they couldn't have videoed me in Colorado. Uh, really? I was in the prison camp there. Oh, I thought you were sitting at a picnic table. It must be I think, I think what some people do is they say the first half of the seven years is the tribulation, and the last half is the wrath. And that's how they get the rapture in the middle. If that is what he believes, which is what someone told me, but I don't know, then I disagree. If that's not what he believes, maybe he believes exactly like me. Of course, if he believes just like I believe, then he's right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, I, I, can't, I can't wait for you to actually get out of prison where you don't have to come through this uh, stupid prison phone system anymore and you can have all of the books and all of the internet resources like the rest of us. And uh, we're certainly looking forward to that day. And uh, uh, th that day cannot come soon enough. And uh, you have a lot of supporters out here. And uh, I think Pastor Stephen Anderson is one of them, as well as many, many other people. So, um, all right. Anything else to add, okay, Babe? Yep. There's one more. Yep. Yeah, one more thing to consider. During any war where allies have to get together, like World War II, we had the Americans and the British and the French were allies. They disagreed on hundreds of things, but they had a bigger common enemy. Even if Stephen Anderson and I disagree on some things, so what? It, it, there's a bigger, bigger picture to look at here. There's a bigger common enemy we have to fight. Amen. I just want to have my two cents. I'm a big Steve Anderson fan. <laughs> all right, babe. Okay. okay. That's okay. All I have to say. I'm so sorry. No, no, Aaron, I apologize. I forgot the Canadians were also part of our allies in World War II. <laughs> That's they, right. They sent, what, a tank? It's called yeah, the State of Olympic Judiciary. <laughs> they sent a tank. A tank and a mountain on a horse. <laughs> <laughs> Two tanks, an airplane, and a jeep, I believe. Oh, my goodness. It helped. It helped with the war. <laughs> oh. Hey, my goodness. Oh, we're, I'm going to hear about that from her mother for a long time, I guarantee you. She, she got upset at your blonde joke, too. <laughs> she got upset at your blonde joke, and I'm, I've never heard the end of that as well. So, um, all right. Well, ha, do, do you think God likes drama? I think God must like drama, because we sure got a lot of it down here. <laughs> Well, he created women, obviously. <laughs> You're right. That's right. That's right. Hey, supper just came, brother. Let me call after supper and devotion. Okay. Okay, okay Pastor Over. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Well, we touch all the topics. Uh, God bless Pastor Hovind. I hope he gets out of there very, very soon. Um, it's not that we don't enjoy doing these Bible questions with him. We certainly do. But it just would be a huge blessing um, for him to be with his family, uh, get started on Dinosaur Adventureland again, and not have to come through this stupid prison telephone system. Um, and be able to, and he can experience the world in its fullness with full internet access, full phone access, call whoever he wants, whenever he wants, read any book he wants. He can't even receive books, has to eat mush, you know, starchy mush for food all the time. And um, we don't got one 
one person in Congress uh, or the Bureau of Prisons or anywhere with any sort, sort of uh, just integrity to do the right thing. It's absolutely insane, but uh, we will continue uh, to support our brother until he takes his first breath of freedom, and we praise God every step of the way. It's been a huge blessing, and it will continue to be a huge blessing, even if we have to go the next 76 days. I pray to God that's not the case. But uh, we ought to be able to make some, a whole lot of noise and shine a whole lot of light if uh, these guys uh, want to act like that. You know, they, they say that they don't want to give Ken Hovind any favors. He's not asking for any favors. He's simply asking that you give him the home confinement that he was already approved. An inmate at the 31st County Sheriff's Office. This call will be recorded and monitored. Your advance pay account balance is $56.00. Please for customer assistance, billing inquiries, or to block future calls, dial 1-877-650-4249. To hear the cost of this call, press 8 now. To accept this call, press 5 now. This call, this call is subject to monitoring and recording. Do not use three-way or call waiting features during this call. Thank you for using Global Tail Link. Brother, we're open here. I hate to monopolize your time, though. Is this good? No, no, it's a good time. It's always it's always a blessing, Pastor Hovind, and we uh, we always have questions and emails. Um, your phone is your phone is breaking up again. My, my wife. Your phone dead. Yeah, my wife, uh, baby. Oh, is it better now, Pastor Hovind? Yeah, maybe if you're a little closer to it. I don't know if it's uh, got a... Who knows? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yep, I hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, we, we have a thunderstorm that just came through the area, and it possibly could have messed up the phones. Um, uh, there, uh, Ant Anthony sends in an email, Pastor Hovind, and Anthony writes, Hello, Dr. Dono. I show clips of your debates to my mom, and she really enjoys them. Thank you so much. My mom wanted, you, my mom wanted me to ask you this question. Why didn't God allow Moses to enter the promised land? Uh, are you recording, Rudy? I didn't hear yeah, you. Yes, sir. I am recording. I did not forget this time. Okay. Uh, God told Moses when the people were thirsty and they were complaining and griping, God told him to smite the rock. <laughs> Excuse me. God told him to smite the rock at Horeb, and Moses did, and the rock split in half, and water came out and watered the people. By the way, that rock has been discovered, I believe. If you go to WyattMuseum.com, you can see it. It's huge, like 50 feet tall. Water came pouring out of there. Get the videos from uh, Ron Wyatt's uh, discoveries of this giant rock at Horeb. Anyway, so God told Moses to smite the rock. Later, I think, I don't know how many, quite a few years later, they were thirsty again, and God told Moses to speak to the rock. But rather than speak to the rock, Moses smote the rock, apparently out of anger or to show off or for whatever, we don't know what reason, but he sm smote the rock the second time. And God said, because of that, you don't get to go into the promised land. So it was Moses' disobedience. Certainly the, one of the many reasons might, might be because this is a symbol of Jesus being the rock of ages, the rock the church is built on, not Peter. Uh, Jesus is only smitten once. He died on Calvary. He will never be smitten again. And so Moses broke what's called the typology. The Bible has a lot of stuff uh, called typology, where something stands for or represents something else. That's a whole study on itself, biblical typology. So that's why Moses did not get to go in, at least right then. Technically, he did get to go in about 1,400 years later. Moses and Elijah came down on and got to go into the promised land just for a few minutes to at least touch down and talk to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. All right, hope that helps. Thank you. All right, thank you, Pastor Hovind. Um, the next question, uh, I think, is from Chris or Kyle, or maybe it's both. I think it's the limo driver. Is the limo driver's name uh, Chris or Kyle, or is it both? I don't know. Okay. His name is Chris. His name is, I think my wife spoke to him. I think his name could be Chris, but he signed his uh, email Kyle, so maybe maybe he goes by both names. Um, no, you're, you're breaking up real bad again, brother. Oh, no. Is this better, Pastor Hovind? Yeah, keep your mouth real close to the speaker. Maybe that's the problem. But go ahead. Okay. Um, 
Okay, Pastor Hovind, uh, I hear this is uh, one of the questions that, uh, this is the last one that I lost in the 15-minute uh, lost tapes of Kent Hovind. <clears throat> I, hear you say, I hear you keep saying the only laws Gentiles are subject to are those listed in Acts 15.20. And we know from 1 John 3.4, the sin of transgression, uh, the sin is the transgression of the law. So you're saying Gentiles only sin by failing to abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood? Am I understanding this correctly, Kyle? Uh, yeah, the phone's still breaking up pretty bad. I don't know if maybe mine's coming out clear to you, but uh, if I understood the question, uh, Acts 15, Acts, uh, from Acts 10 to 15, it covers this very question. What exactly are the Gentiles required to do? And the early church had a conference, and the guys who had lived with Jesus all those years, the disciples themselves and others, came to the conclusion there in Acts chapter 15 of what is required of the Gentiles. Now, we are not under the law, uh, like the Sabbath, etc. However, we still are to obey the authority over us, so for that would include things like speed limit and paying taxes that you owe, and we certainly should always obey the law. And I have tried to do that, and I think uh, everybody should. Okay, that's a, an obligation. So, <clears throat> um, if someone is asking this question, trying to uh, bring us back under all of those laws, like the Sabbath, etc., uh, I think it's pretty clear from Acts 15, 20, and 29 that no, we are not under those. If you want to, that's fine. And we certainly should look at why God gave any of his laws, and there's a reason for it, thou shalt not kill, etc., and we should certainly do that. Uh, but is it a requirement of the Christians in order to be a Christian? or in order to please God. That's maybe a thing, the difference between your Christian obligation and your civic obligation. Uh, I don't know that I can give a thorough answer to that question, other than I can just read what it says in Acts 15, 20. It said, don't, don't do anything else to these Gentile Christians except these four things. <coughs> okay, did I answer that, brother, or did it go off on a rabbit trail? No, no, I think I think you answered it, and uh, is, is the sound better? Is, I'll try to lean as close as I can to the phone. Oh, yeah, you're breaking up real bad, like uh, garbled, like low battery or something. Or... Yeah, we we just we just had a thun we, It could be the thunderstorm, and we've just had a tremendous amount of rain, and it could be the lines are wet, Pastor Hovind. Oh, it's really sort of unconditional, so it's you, you can try to call back, or we can try to wait for another time, maybe when the phone lines dry out a little bit. Maybe it is drying out. Oh, you just sounded better just then. Go ahead, and try one more. Okay. It heals up. Okay. Um, Okay, give me just a second. All right, uh, Pastor Hoven, uh, William writes in, and he's asking for your thoughts on if Christian militias are biblical. Okay. Uh, interesting question, William. The founders of this country back in the 17, oh, probably starting the 1740s or 50s, they got very concerned about some of the things happening with the, the British leadership. Uh, our, our first loyalty is to God. We certainly should obey Him, and we should obey those in authority over us. The question would come up exactly, who is that and what authority do they have? <laughs> and is their authority limited to certain areas, certain times, or certain people? That's the whole jurisdictional question. Uh, I think it's perfectly fine if a person wants to join the military and go off and fight for their country. They should. My dad did join the Marines World War II after Pearl Harbor was attacked and fought the Japanese in the Pacific Ocean for years and was the only survivor of his platoon, uh, so I've been told. Um, my brother-in-law, my sister's uh, husband, flew a Huey helicopter, uh, flew a Huey helicopter in Vietnam. So yes, it's perfectly fine. I think I don't see any scriptural thing. Jesus said uh, soldiers should be content with their wages. He did not say they shouldn't be a soldier. Just if you're a soldier, be content with your wages. Uh, that was his commandment to them. Uh, <coughs> as far as a Christian militia, 
I guess I need to know a little more clearly exactly what you mean by that. Uh, there does come a time uh, in, in many countries where it's perfectly right to throw out the people who are, have violated the law, even if they happen to be in a position of authority. That's what the Magna Carta was about back in the 1200s. They said, King, you are not God. Let's explain it to you. That's what the Declaration of Independence was about in 1776. There does come a time, or there can come a time, when the people have to rise up and say, look, the law is supreme, not this person sitting in that chair. Which goes back to the question of who's the man, not the, not the institution. Who is the man that gave this order? Uh, that's what we're working on in my situation. Like, why am I still in jail a week after I was, the charges were dropped and I was eligible and qualified to go to home confinement? I'd already been approved. Well, some person, not some institution, some individual person dropped the ball, and they, that person, is responsible for their actions. And this is Common Sense 101 and law. And that's the law. So who is who is responsible? If a person, for instance, if a policeman pulls your wife over for speeding and says, get out of the car and take off your clothes. Well, now hold it, sir. You're, you're exceeding your authority. No, I refuse. Okay, the, the, your wife has a right and an obligation to do that. <coughs> so just because someone have a, has a badge might give them authority to do some things, but it does not give them unlimited open authority to do everything. And that includes the president on down in Congress. And if they exceed their authority, sometimes they have to be stopped. And that's where militias come in. I'm not part of one, never have been part of one. I, I think that they do, though, hold a legitimate place in history and in common sense. There should have been a German militia rise up and kill Hitler. If they had done that seven years earlier, it would have saved a whole lot of problems for the world. They did. Some tried. But somebody should have risen up against Stalin way before he got uh, out of control. So all you got to do is look at dictatorships around the world, and boy, somebody should have done something sooner. We look at uh, don't we send our troops into Afghanistan and Iraq and I and not Iran yet? Why are we sending troops to Afghanistan? Why did we take Saddam Hussein out? Was that the equivalent, or is that an analogy, of a militia rising up to take out an evil leader? I think quite obviously it is. So yeah, there does come a time when that type of activity is justified. Hope that helps. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Um, hi, Pastor Hovind, are you able to hear me okay? Yeah, the phone line's right out. Perfect. Uh, okay. Good, good, good. All right. Okay, here's a... Uh, or, or, or maybe, maybe... The Hang on, maybe Scott Schneider and those that always listen to all my hi, Scott. Maybe they're, maybe they have the problem on their end. <laughs> it could be. I tell you what. They're recording device. <laughs> okay. There's going to be many, Go many. There's going to be many, many, many benefits when you get out of prison, and one of them is I expect my phone line to start working a whole lot better. But um, uh, okay. here's here's uh, here's an email from Julie, and I wanted to read this to you, sir. Uh, Julie writes, I cannot tell you, Pastor Hovind, how much I appreciate you, your work, your love for the Lord and the Lord's creation, your honor, your strength, your brilliance, your humor. I could go on. But the most humbling thing is that you are my brother in Christ, and it amazes me that I can call you that. I've been consumed with prayers for Kent, his family, Paul, the Kent's converts, the legal souls on both sides, all those involved with this website and others, the whole kit and caboodle, I admit I have some theological differences with Pastor Hovind and may submit a question later on, but right now those are the least important things to me. I have learned so much from your creation videos and debates and not just about science and theology, but about truth, honor, steadfastness, love, grace, speaking the truth in love and even humor. Pastor Hoven, your wit, your wit is such a blessing. Again, I could go on, but you're, you're getting the point. I, I was introduced to Pastor Hoven's ministry about five years ago, and I'm ashamed I didn't realize the pot of gold I had, as well as the spiritual battle that was going on. I cherish the day I will meet uh, Pastor Hoven when you are physically a free man. Spiritually, he is free already. I thank Pastor Hovind, and I love you. A godly love, Mrs. Hovind. I'm not flirting with your husband, LOL. God bless uh, Pastor Hovind, Julie. Hmm. Well, thank you, Julie. 
I appreciate that. That's quite a list of compliments, brother. She said, I'm witty, I'm steadfast, honorable, brilliant, and she included in there humble. Yeah, it's extremely rare that people call... This call is from the Sunday County Sheriff's Office. I don't get called that very often, usually quite the opposite. Uh, but I think once they read my book uh, that's about to come out, The World's Three Most Humble People and How I Trained the Other Two, I think maybe that will help uh, set the record straight. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. I think a lot of people confuse... Um... Amen, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. I, 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 humility with, they, 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 think, they think it's pride, but it's actually just confidence. I'm confident in my God and his word. Moses was too. Moses was the meekest man in all the earth. He doesn't say the weakest. He was the... You have 60 seconds remaining. I have a great deal of confidence in my God and his word. And such as some people that translate as ego, but it's really not me that they're mad at. It's God they're mad at. That's the real problem. Amen. Anyway, sure, I can call back, brother. Calls are open here if you'd like. Yes, sir. We, we, we got a few more questions. Yes, sir. I'll call right back. Okay, very good. This call will be recorded and monitored. Your advance pay account balances $52.07. For customer assistance, billing inquiries, or to block future calls, dial 1-877-650. question comes in from Rick, and Rick uh, quotes some Bible verses. Uh, first off, he quotes uh, Revelation 2, 8 through 10, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich, and I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Hello, Pastor Hoven. Blessings in Jesus Christ our Lord, Rick. Question number one. What is the difference between the tribulation for 10 days in Revelation as compared to the great tribulation of Matthew 24, 21? And then he has a part two. What does the tribulation for 10 days in Revelation... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. When, when does the tribulation of 10 days in Revelation take place? I.e., during the great tribulation or the wrath of God, etc. Thank you, Pastor Hovind Rick. Great question. Short answer, don't know. It might be that the ten days of tribulation that that particular church uh, endured, I have heard that the word Smyrna is based on the word myrrh, which is an embalming fluid, and the symbolic of that church went through the persecution period. Those who teach the panoramic view of the seven churches of, of Asia, of Revelation 2 and 3, would teach that they represent seven time periods of church history. And I believe there may be something to that. I wouldn't go off on too much of a rabbit trail on that, but the, that church, that particular church at Smyrna, did indeed go through some horrible persecution times, and it may represent the bigger picture of the entire church going through the Roman persecution. And it might be that there were ten persecutions. I've heard speak, people speak on that from like Fox's Book of Martyrs. There were ten specific periods where certain Roman emperors decided we're going to kill all the Christians. So that might be the answer to the problem, or to the, to the dilemma. I'm a little concerned about going beyond the clear, obvious teaching of Scripture. It certainly was a message to that particular church. And John was told in Revelation 10, you are going to get off of this island and go back and deliver this message to these churches, which is another evidence the rapture cannot be imminent. It's not taught any place in Scripture that the rapture is imminent. We're told to wait for the Lord and watch for the Lord. I can wait and watch for my birthday, but I can't change the date of it. So that is not an argument for imminency, they call it. It could come any second. It's simply not true. But it could be that 
I think the, uh, the Smyrna church was an actual church that went through 12, 10 days of persecution. That could be the end of the story. But again, it might have a bigger picture, a symbolic meaning of something coming at the end about the coming time of tribulation or wrath. Tribulation is what the world does to us. And Jesus said in John 16, In the world ye shall have tribulation. Wrath is what God does to the world, and we are not appointed unto wrath. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 and 1 Thessalonians 5.9 and many other verses make that clear. Wrath is mentioned in the book of Revelation starting at the end of chapter 6. The, we are raptured out at Revelation 6.12 when the sun and the moon go dark. <coughs> That's the rapture. I was always taught it's Revelation 4.1, you know, come up hither. That is not symbolic of the rapture. The sun and the moon go dark is the sign. The disciples asked Jesus, Lord, when are you coming and what's the sign? Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, same parallel passage there. And Jesus answered him, I'm coming after the tribulation. When the sun and the moon go dark and there's an earthquake. That's the sign. So, couldn't be more clear. Um, <coughs> So the long answer to the question, does the uh, Revelation 2 passage uh, symbolize something coming in the future? Maybe. I don't know. Uh, there's enough other passages telling us about the future. We don't need that one that tells us there's going to come, be coming hard times on the planet. Okay, I hope that helps. Thank you for the question. All right. Uh, thank you, Pastor Hoban. The next question comes in from Anonymous, and uh, Anonymous writes, There seems to be a growing number of sinkholes throughout the world. Do you have any thoughts on this? And... Uh, uh, praying for your soon release. Thank you, Pastor Hovind. Interesting. A sinkhole is where there's a cave underground and then the surface mm, gets too thin and caves in. It sinks down into the hole. Hence the name sinkhole. Um, I think they've gone all through history. It's been pretty common for these. There are, there are many, many thousands of them around the world that are quite obviously sinkholes. Uh, and they happen in Central Florida all the time. Uh, I think if you look at this from a biblical perspective, and Walt Brown's book in the beginning uh, is fabulous. It's on creationtoday.org. My son sells it. I've sold it for years. His book is called In the Beginning. He deals a whole lot, like for 250 pages, with the geology of the earth, how that after the flood 4,400 years ago, the earth would be covered in these thick layers of mud, and the crust of the earth would be cracked up like an eggshell. This crust would be flexing uh, up and down with slight responses to gravitational pull, because the this call is from the Florida Weather County Sheriff's Office. Gravity will try to pull the Earth into a perfect circle, like a raindrop falling. It tries to pull itself into a circle because of surface tension. But gravity would try to pull the Earth into a circle, but centrifugal force tries to make it bulge a little bit because of the spin, which Rudy may disagree with. But it does bulge about, uh, I think, 20 miles compared to the polar diameter. Uh, and so Walt Brown's book is fabulous on this, how these various forces would cause several things to happen on the crust of the Earth. The drying out uh, is one thing that would happen. The surface would dry out, and it, the deeper, the thicker that crust gets, the harder it is to dry out, because now there's water trapped underneath this, this solid crust. So let's say that the, the rate of drying is going to slow down to the point where maybe it, it simply cannot ever dry out. The water's trapped, moisture's trapped. If there's water in the rock and it happens to be limestone, the, uh, if there's any acid in that rock, in the, in the water, and certainly rainwater, Water contains a slight bit of acid. If it goes through decaying leaves, it becomes what's called carbonic acid, and that slight acidity to the water will uh, eat away the limestone. That's what causes caves. So it could be that this is still increasing, or still happening, because of Noah's flood 4,400 years ago. So that would be my uh, uh, short answer to that question. Okay, thank you. Very good. Thank you, Pastor Hoven. And uh, you are right, we still disagree, but that's all right. We can uh, disagree uh, while not being disagreeable. And I would also add that uh, Randall agrees with me, which I think is agreeable with the Bible, and Jerry Rose as well. So it's not just Rudy, by the way. But, um, okay. Uh, Pass oh, I've got three, three of you to straighten. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you get to the top of the mountain, we'll all three be waiting for you, and we'll, we'll have a Texas barbecue. So, uh, all right, Pastor Hoven. Okay, sounds good. 
<laughs> very good, very good. Okay, uh, the next question comes in from Rick, and Rick writes, uh, in James 1, 2 through 8, and he quotes all of the verses, although I'll just read verse 8, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Uh, Rick goes on to write, uh, question, what is a double-minded man? And then uh, he, he says, I'm praying for a hedge of protection around you and Paul Hansen. God bless you, Rick. Well, I think a double-minded man is in that passage, or in any passage actually, would be a person who tries to do two things at the same time. You can't decide which way to go. You're driving down the road and there's a big rock in the middle of the road and you can't decide to go right or left, and so you run into the rock instead. Don't do that, okay? Do one or the other. Some decisions you can simply not make the decision, it doesn't matter, but sometimes it does matter. So it's talking about back in verse 6, six or verse 5, if you lack wisdom, ask God. And then verse 6 says, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. In other words, don't, don't go back and forth between faith and doubt. Just believe or doubt. Uh, but he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable. Get a decision. Are you going to believe God or not? Um, I think, it, who was it that said, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord's God, follow him. Oh, that was, uh, but if Baal is, that was Elijah in 1 Kings, uh, about 6, 17, 18, somewhere in there. He builds this altar on top of the mountain and says, look, you guys have been serving this stupid God Baal long enough. Well, get, make a decision. Get in or get out. Okay, are you going to serve God or Baal? How long haul ye between two opinions? I think a lot of people do. A lot of Christians do that. They're not sure if they want to live for God or not. So they've got one foot in the world and one foot on the, in the Bible. Well, get in or get out. Now, that's a double-minded man to my, in my way of thinking. Okay, hope that helps. All right. No, thank you, Pastor Hovind. Very, very, very good. Uh, the next question also comes in from Rick, and Rick quotes uh, Matthew 27.3. It says, Then Judas, who had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of thirty pieces of silver to the chief priest and elders. Uh, Rick's question. What is the significance and story of the thirty pieces of silver? Kent, you are a blessing to the body of Christ and are truly loved by thousands of Christians worldwide. Thank you for your strong Christian faith and encouraging testimony, Rick. And he's asking about what is the significance and story of the 30 pieces of silver. Very good. Thank you, sir. I think if you go back and study the Old Testament, I'm trying to find it quickly here. I may not get it in time. You'll see that 30 pieces of silver was the price of a slave. That's what it cost to buy a slave. So he's really saying Jesus is no more value than a slave. Uh, see, that's 27.3. My Bible does not have a reference to the Old Testament passage about the 30 pieces, but I'm sure a good reference Bible would have some notes on that about going back to either Exodus or Leviticus about the typical cost of a slave, 30 pieces of silver. Okay? Hope that helps, brother. All right, very good. Uh, the next question also comes in from Rick, and Rick writes, um, well, f uh, first of all, uh, Rick quotes Genesis 6, uh, 12 through 15, and I'll just read verse 15, and this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. Of the length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. Rick's question. How long do you think it took Noah to build the ark? Part 2. Pre-flood, what lessons should Christians glean from Noah's walk with the Lord, other than learning that his neighbors bitterly complained about the ark blocking their driveways? Uh, Brother Kent, I have always... Pers I have personally always enjoyed your sense of humor while teaching. You have made studying the Word of God along with creation evidence fun for Christians of all ages and all backgrounds. Thousands of Christians are prayerfully awaiting your timely release. Uh, Rick. Well, thank you. Two questions there. The first one, how long did it take to build the ark? Nobody knows. The Hebrew tradition says seven years. Uh, there is a prophecy where somebody prophesied they have 120 years 
uh, many people think Enoch prophesied, hey, you've got 120 years. Uh, that, that argument's been made that that means nobody lives past 120. Now, I don't believe that, but the, uh, that's another, another question. But it, it may have taken no 120 years to build the boat. It does talk about it in the book of Jude. It says, while the ark was preparing, people, people worldwide knew about this construction project. He's building this boat. Why on earth would you build a boat in the middle of a cornfield or wherever he was? Noah, what is wrong with you? Especially if before the flood came, it had never rained, which is very possibly the truth. Uh, the Bible says a mist went forth and watered the ground, and it does not talk about rain until the day of the flood. It doesn't mean it didn't happen, but I believe with the canopy above, which some creationist groups do not believe there was a canopy, and of course they're wrong, I'm right, there was a canopy. Uh, especially if you stick with the King James, there's water above the firmament. It couldn't be more clear. So, I, I covered that many times before. The, uh, it, it's possible Noah was preaching about rain, which had never happened on the planet. Uh, so, it, people had plenty of warning that it's not only going to rain, you're going to drown if you don't get on this boat. And they simply refused. Or, or didn't, they didn't take the warning. Lessons to learn. Wow, there are multiple lessons. Uh, there's a funny story on the going around the internet about things I learned about Noah's Ark. You know, the Ark was built by amateurs, the Titanic by professionals. <laughs> a whole list of comparisons between Noah's Ark and the, and the Titanic. Um, one is uh, Noah's Ark. We have 60 seconds remaining. Another is it wasn't raining when he started building the Ark. Uh, people sometimes wait till it's too late to get prepared for things. Uh, so there's all kinds of lessons in life. Plus, you simply obey God. You don't need to understand. God said, Noah, build a boat. He didn't explain why. Just Noah build a boat. Okay, yes, Lord. You just, just simply do what God says. It doesn't have to make sense at the time. It will later. All right. Hope that helps. All right. More questions, brother? Well, thank you, Pastor. Let, let me get some more coordinated, if you don't mind, and you're welcome to call back either later tonight or tomorrow. Uh, it's up to you, but I probably do need to get some time to coordinate them. Sounds good. Yeah, I'll call later tonight just to check in, and then tomorrow morning. Thank you, brother. Okay. All right. God bless Bye -bye. you, Pastor Owen. Bye-bye. All right, that's Pastor Hovind, and uh, he's uh, nearly nine years in prison. Uh, he thought he was going to get out. Uh, then they came at him with new charges, and they dropped the charges. Now he's staring 75 days. He's staring down the barrel of 75 days, waiting to get out to get, go back with his family. Um, mm -mm -mm. Wish he could get. Oh, wish he could.